Why do businesses need IT, <coughs> IT based services? Now we'll have a little bit of a look at that first of all, and then we'll look at how does IT actually support many businesses? Because IT is not negative all the time. It actually provides a lot of benefits to businesses. It helps deliver certain business strategies. So we want to look at both sides of the coin. If we go right back, and we're going back in history now, to the late 90s, it was assumed that IT should support and be aligned with the business strategy. That's where the company wants to go. That's what a strategy is. It's the direction you're trying to follow. A second question that's been worrying a lot of people, chief information officers, chief execs, boards of companies, is what is the value of all this extraordinary amount of money that's been poured into IT over the years? and every year. Something like $3 trillion a year are spent on IT, and communications, software, developing systems, running them and so on. And that equates to about 5% of world GDP, the total value that's created by the world in terms of business and activity. So we're spending something like 5% all of the wealth that's generated in the world on this thing called IT. What's the value we get back from that? And as part of that, so we've got a question what we mean by the value of it, because it's not entirely obvious what we mean by value of IT. But maybe we can answer a different question. How does IT provide some value to the businesses using it? And to do that, we need to think about what does IT do well, and what can, can't IT do well? Computer systems and so on. So we'll be covering that over the next little while. Now let's start with something that's really quite entertaining, quite fun. <coughs> Claudia Shibora and Early Hanseth came up with this pretty map of how things actually seem to work. This is, they wrote this back in 2002. And it's in a book called From Control to Drift. And you can find that definitely in the library. The first four chapters are written by these two guys and one other guy. And they're a little bit difficult to read. They're a little bit philosophical. But in the middle is this interesting picture. However, the other part of the book, the ten or so case studies, are quite easy to read. And they are very, very enlightening about different aspects of IT as it fits into this idea of trying to provide value to the organisation. Now, Shibora and Hanseth were sort of basically starting with standard strategic management theory. First of all, that management control the business that they're managing and that they want to have a business strategy because that's what the textbooks teach. And the critical inputs into the business strategy come from market forces, things like globalization, cost reduction, standardization, more and more speed in terms of communication and decision making. And it comes also from opportunities that come from new technologies. And the stuff I was seeing last week out in um, the IBM world of Watson. Now, there are so many amazing things becoming available in that Watson cognitive environment. That can give new systems, it can help new ways of connecting companies together, it can give new ways of helping to advise decision makers, whether it's doctors or company decision makers. And it builds, this is the direction we're going to go in, the new strategy. And classic theory says, yep, we start at the top and cascade the top level corporate structure down to different divisions, building in the IT strategies and communication strategies and so on. So they all support each other. But Hanseth and Sh or Shibora and Hanseth then said, but hang on, this actually makes, for most companies, it makes life more complicated because you can't start afresh. You've already got an operating company. 
And so these new ideas fit in alongside and on top of what's already working. It makes life more complicated, <coughs> more complex, uh, needs more standards to make sure everything works together. And when you get down to the implementation of these new ideas, then things, they said, start going odd. When this was written, typically the angry orphans were the ones who were left on the side. They got systems that they loved that worked really well. And the typical example was of the, um, the sales and marketing people who loved their MacBooks because Mac was so good with audiovisual material. They were brilliant at designing new uh, presentations and posters and everything else. <coughs> and when you went into the Wintel environment, they got kind of shoved there off on the edge of the land until Apple came up with their rather newer versions where you can run Windows and OS X together. Best of both worlds. Or you forgot, as you were doing this, about unintended consequences, all sorts of surprise and side effects that you hadn't thought about. And then things start getting complicated and compromised. You don't have this lovely clean vision up here. Things start getting aligned from the bottom rather than from the top. And that means things drift, hence control to drift. And of course you go back around there because you've got to get back into control, so you've got to do more of that. And the consequence is you drift a bit further off control, which is rather unfortunate. A different problem, second the IT productivity paradox, which we, which we really do not fully understand. If you, a, company, a manufacturing company invests in some manufacturing technology, <coughs> the normal expectation and the normal result is you get better productivity if you've done it properly. You get more value for money. Things get, you can make things cheaper. You can make more profit. But as you pour money into ERP systems and all sorts of things like that, it's been incredibly difficult to see what the return is on the bottom line. Delivering services doesn't necessarily become much cheaper. And if you actually look at the, the, the annual uh, profit and loss accounts, although you're possibly spending less on payroll, on people, you aren't actually making any more profit than you were 50 years ago in percentage terms. Whereas you do see that benefit if you invest in machinery. Now, it's part possibly because we're looking for, you know, I want to see an improvement in the profitability of the company <coughs> in one way or another. It might be because we're trying to go quantitative. Rather than thinking about the intangible benefits, we can do business faster, more efficiently, we can satisfy the customer better, we can reduce churn. It's typical intangibles. But most of those can actually be turned back into pound notes or dollar bills very easily. Now this to me is one of the most interesting um, charts of that ra the total randomness in terms of return on investment and the levels of investment. Okay, it goes back to 1994. But I don't know of any evidence that suggests this has actually changed significantly in the last 20 odd years. Notice this is a logarithmic scale on both the bottom axis and in the, on the left hand one as well. Well, this is up logarithmic, that's not, but, <coughs> sorry. But look at, if you ignore the top outliers, but if you look at that section there, it doesn't really matter whether you spend $100 a person or $100,000 a person, you have as much likelihood of making zero return on investment or 0.4% return on equity. It is entirely random what, what you get in global terms, in the an analytical terms. If you actually looked at the individual details of every single one of those, you might be able to work out what was causing those lot to be successful 
and those lot to be seriously unsuccessful. But there is no, eff effectively, in normal analytics terms, no correlation between spend and equity. And remember, that's three, sorry, a thousand times more spend per person, per employee, at this end, compared to that end. So there's something curious going on. This is essentially the same data plotted against slightly different scales, and someone has done a regression analysis on it, which shows that <coughs> there is a line you can sort of plot through the middle of that. Now I then saw, I don't think I've got it in here, no. A year or two after I saw that one, I saw someone who had plotted the bottom end, there's a vertical bar there, and one there that said, if you spent lots of money on IT, look, you get a 15% improvement between there and there. And I eventually tracked down the data they were using, which was this pretty picture, which is the other picture that's slightly been plotted. And as you can see from that, there is no obvious correlation at all. It's a random cloud of random results. So it says here, correlated with productivity, but substantial. Come off it. You've really got to think about that. There's no correlation at all. R squared there is probably about 0.02. In other words, it's random. So anybody who takes a cloud of data that big, where you've got that variation or that level of variation is living in cloud cuckoo land. There is no correlation at all. It's random, essentially. Certainly, if you are looking to use that, you wouldn't go to spend $100,000 per head. You would try and keep it down here and try and be as clever as possible to get up to there rather than be the unlucky ones down here. But you cannot under any circumstances, make any statement about the slope of that line. It's, why should I bet on it? It goes back to something that Daniel Kahneman has said in his book, Thinking uh, Fast and Slow, or Thinking Fast and Slow, about the optimistic or bias of optimism that we have. We always think that we're going to be the lucky ones. And if we go back to this other one, you know, the ones below that, the 50%, didn't succeed. Why should I be in the 50% who shall succeed? Or Standish Group data, 23% roughly, 25% now are successful. That means I've got to be very, very careful if I want to be one of the successful ones, because I'm more likely to be one of the other 75% who are either challenged or failure. But now everybody goes into these with this bias for optimism. We will be successful. We've got no plans to be particularly successful, but we're going to be successful this time. And it's kind of bizarre. Value. Some of the claims, and these have been here for several decades, about IT, why it's good. It can help individual business processes, it connects business processes, <coughs> we can connect with our suppliers. And yes, everybody's using ERP systems to do this sort of thing. And we're relying on the system to do it right, except we haven't got everything in place and the data needs cleansing every five years because the systems aren't able to capture everything that needs to be captured and people shoehorn it in with special codes and so on, somehow or other. We've been seeing these statements for, as I say, gosh, these are about 30 years old, these statements. And they keep being re uh, regurgitated. Better decision making. And again, you could see this at World of Watson, how the cognitive side and the predictive analytics side 
is helping us to have more information. But it's how we use it, not the system itself. Yeah, the search costs. You can, I mean, we can see how that's working. You can, there are websites out there that provide mechanisms for auctions. So I can put on there, I need to have a thousand containers of this size, of this plastic, this specification. And the world knows about that one. And small new entrepreneurs can find that and say, oh, I can do better than everybody else. And so, uh, it makes it very easy for big companies to find small suppliers if they want to have new, innovative suppliers. Those of you who watch Formula One, my favourite um, example here is, you know, we saw things break last week in um, Austin, or two weeks before that in wherever that was, and in a week or two, a team can redesign components, get them stress analyzed, fully tested, electronically manufactured, and it's available on, on wet Thursday to fit on the test drives in the free practice <coughs> on Friday. Couldn't do it without computers. So they've also um, analyzed the failure modes. Yeah, we can do all sorts of interesting things in there, or we can do like that with white goods, where you know, putting electronic chips into white goods, washing machines, fridges, <coughs> have allowed us to have much cheaper, much more reliable in general uh, products and services. We can develop new products. If you think about, who knows of Capital One, credit card company? Back in 1999, I think it was, in an interview, the, one of the very senior guys of Capital One, and might have been the chief exec, I can't remember, was asked, what is the business of Capital One? And the interviewer was expecting the answer, credit cards. No, that wasn't the answer. He said, data. We are a data company. Because they know everything about the expenditure patterns that go through your cards. And they have a team over in Nottingham who actually do a lot of data mining and come up with new financial services products for us, the Capital One help card holders. And you'll see this with every um, bank who has a card. You can just imagine what will happen in a, a few years' time when someone like Amazon decides, or pay, yeah, Amazon says, ah, oh, we know everything about you. We know your purchase of books and videos, and we know what you do with... Uh, Amazon Prime, and we know everything about you. We know where you live. We're going to leverage all of that money, all that knowledge, to give you credit cards. That'll cause the banks some interest, a bit of fun, a bit of danger, a major disruption. Well, you've already started doing data analytics, so you understand how that works. You're aware, to, a little bit I guess by now, of how text analytics is developing, sentiment analysis in big data analytics. You can do that with Watson Analytics, you can do it with SAS. <coughs> to help understand the relationship between yourself and your customers. Things we could never do before. So. need to do some research. Have a look at Paul Strassman's website. He's an amazing guy. He was the guy who wrote a lot about the problems with uh, outsourcing, the problems with this uh, deficit in um, the value that we perceive. There's a huge amount of information there that will give you some very interesting perspectives. <clears throat> There's a lot of sources in here, all of which are accessible, or almost all of which are still accessible, I think, uh, through uh, the online library. We'll give you some perspectives from a while ago. I want you also to look for some much more modern stuff, see how, whether it has changed. 
Is it really as bleak as these guys have said? At least you know the questions now. Now you can go and find out, has anyone been developing ideas? And you need to find academically sound paper documents here, not just the marketing blurb from all of the companies who provide analytic software, because they are very, very positive about all the benefits that critical success stories are showing. What we're not seeing so much of in the, pre in the modern press, as opposed to the research press, is actually is the, how many people are actually being as successful as the, case, the success stories are. From IBM Insight two years ago, it sounded as though it might not have been quite as successful. It might still be on Standish Group level numbers of success. What else can you find out? How can you use this information to start thinking really positively about your assignment, to find out? Now, what is the value going to be of this service you're developing? And then there, at the top there is another book by Claudia Shibora. That book is only a little tiny thin one, and I read it in about six hours going up to a conference in Glasgow by train. My head hurt badly at the end of it, but there are some lovely nuggets in there. Really magical stuff. The Control to Drift there are, as I say, about 10 case studies from around about the mid to late 1990s, which are, again, very, very instructional. And the problem with IT today, and again, I asked people while I was out in, at the conference, is IT more or less successful today than it was 10, 15 years ago? And every conference I go to, people have you know, more than 10 years of experience. They've got 20, 25, 30 years of experience. The answer almost always comes back, no, it is not more successful. It is more fractured, more broken, more unreliable. And that's kind of worrying. So how are you going to answer that, guys, in your assignment to make it more successful? Okay, well, there ends that part. <laughs>